Hello, and this presentation is called The Fourth Big Boom, The Boom in Social Inequality. So we've looked at three big booms so far of what we're calling the exponential age, the exponential growth of human populations, the exponential growth of human energy consumption, the exponential growth in the production of food. And these, as we'll see, are linked together closely. And now we're going to look at a fourth exponential boom. And this is the growth of social inequality, the gap between the well-to-do and the not-so-well-to-do. So these big booms have not been evenly distributed globally. And we can see this first with population growth. So the growth rate in populations, and this is back in the early 90s when things were really cooking along, is not equally distributed. And as this chart shows, growth has been heaviest in what are called the developing countries. And for the last 50 years, it's been slowest in the industrialized countries. So one thing that seems key to reducing population growth is industrialization. It seems to bring a family size down. But this is certainly a cooperation problem, reducing population growth. How do we get people to cooperate in this? If we look at food, Raj Patel's book, The Stuffed and the Starved, looks at the great disparities in access to food. So we've got part of the world that's facing an obesity epidemic of too much food and not necessarily the most nutritious food. And then we've got another part of the world where too little food, particularly during childhood, causes malnutrition and one biological signal of this is stunted growth. So the red countries on the right are where you have the highest childhood malnutrition. The red countries in orange on the left are where you have the highest obesity rates. And you'll notice that Saudi Arabia and the Arab Emirates have caught the United States in terms of obesity. So achieving food parity, this is also a cooperation problem. If we look at the global economy and money, which we say is the root of all evil, it seems to be a measure of all of these things. The global economy amounts to $24 trillion in a gross global production. And then if we look at the wealth of the richest 200 individuals in the world, it's a roughly a trillion dollars. 4% of the world economy is in the hands of 200 individuals. And nothing like that has ever existed before. And if we compare their wealth to the combined income, so we're going from wealth to income, to the combined income of the poorest 2.4 billion people, um, their wealth is greater. So we have opposite ends of the spectrum that we can see in national statistics. Japan ranked 27th in the world in 2007 for per capita income, which came out to 33,400 American dollars per individual in Japan. So Japan is very much an affluent society and an industrialized society. Zimbabwe was at the bottom in 2007 with a per capita income of 200 American dollars per individual. And this shows a set of uh, older Zimbabwe women with a child, which as we'll see is really uh, notable. Now you might think uh, $200 a year is impossible to live on. Um, it's not a problem if you're producing a good deal of your subsistence. But obviously, if you're in a market economy where you get everything with cash, it's a very significant problem. And increasingly, it's a problem for everyone in the world. 
because every human being in the world today relies on the market, on money, for part of their livelihood. And often, even if it's a small part, it's a critical contribution. So again, the reason I chose Japan and Zimbabwe was because uh, Japan and Zimbabwe have another contrast. Female life expectancy in Zimbabwe in 2008 was somewhere between 34 and 44 years. And that's based on different data sources. Whether you use the World Bank or the United Nations or the CIA, you get different numbers. This doesn't mean there weren't any people growing older in Zimbabwe, but it means that there was high rates of childhood mortality, but particularly in Zimbabwe, high rates of mortality among young adults due to AIDS. There's 1.6 million orphans in Zimbabwe caused by the death of their mothers uh, in midlife. And as a result, 90% uh, of those orphans are raised by their extended families. And there you see a hardworking grandmother raising her five grandchildren um, due to the deaths of her own children. Japan had the highest female life expectancy, and we use female life expectancy because women generally live longer than men. In Japan, that was 85.5 years in 2008. And here's a photo of a Japanese grandmother with her pet cat um, resting peacefully. So this illustrates opposite ends of the spectrum in terms of life expectancy. Money, again, is a measure of well-being for most of the world's population, and it remains scarce for most of the world's population. So if we define poverty as living on a dollar a day or less, that's 880 million people in 2005. If we're willing to say poverty is less than $10 per day, that raises it to over 5 billion people uh, trying to live on $10 a day. So there's a great divide. Five billion people living on $10 a day or less. Uh, where do they live in the world? We're going to use software that's called World Mapper. You can look up at www.worldmapper.org and create your own uh, cool maps. So here's the world uh, proportional to area. And given that the globe is round, it always involves distortions. Uh, creating a flat map. This is the world proportional to where people living on $10 a day or less live. And you'll see that Western Europe has basically disappeared to nothing. Uh, the same with the US and Canada. You can't hardly see Australia or Japan. But India has ballooned along with Pakistan and Bangladesh and Vietnam and the Philippines. Africa is very visible. 53 million people in 2005 were living on $200 a day or more. That amounts to $73,000 or more per capita. So where do those people live? And here we've drawn the world proportional to where the people living on $200 a day or more live. And now you can certainly see Western Europe and Japan and the United States and Australia. The only part of Africa that's visible is South Africa. But it gives us a sense of the great distortions in the world in terms of income. So for every individual who's living on more than $200 a day, there's a thousand people living on $10 or less. And to quote the World Bank, GNP per capita tends to be closely linked with other indicators measuring well-being, including social, economic, and environmental well-being. And in those nations with the highest GNP per capita, you have the highest life expectancy, literacy rates, access to safe water, and the lowest uh, infant mortality rates. And they have a much longer list of things that correlate uh, with high income. And this is a measure uh, from a Gallup poll published in The Economist magazine. And what it shows are regression lines um, showing how life satisfaction is related 
uh, to income. So it appears that as income goes up, people's satisfaction with their life also goes up. So what's to be done about this? The answer for the last 70 years has been development, which means industrialization, uh, integration into the market system and a money economy, and strong, stable states through building strong militaries around the world. And there's certainly a link uh, here, then. It's not just money, but when we're talking about industrialism as the answer, there's a link between GDP, which was linked to all those good things, and energy. We have to take into account uh, the size of nations, and this shows transport sector energy consumption per capita relative to GDP. And you'll see that the U.S. is way out here, but of course we're a big country, right? Canada is out at the high level in Australia too. But this raises a question, uh, can we really industrialize the whole world and the whole world lead an in energy intensive lifestyle? And as we're all aware now, although there's been a lot of efforts to make us unaware, industrialism is atmospheric change because all of those fossil fuels we're burning uh, show up as emissions. One of the, and as people have burned more and more uh, fossil fuels, the emissions have gone up. If we look at who's doing the emitting, Back in 2005, the USA was number one, producing 25% of CO2 emissions with just 5% of the population. Uh, China has since surpassed us, um, but we shouldn't take too much glee in that because much of what is produced in China is consumed here. So if we measure it that way, um, we're still number one. So what if the whole world was like the USA? The answer is that carbon emissions would soar five-fold over their current levels. So this is the current level down here. Uh, these steps show first uh, China and then India coming on board. And then the red bar over here shows if the whole world was uh, using energy from fossil fuels like the United States, uh, you'd have five times the level of carbon emissions that you have now. So can we achieve uh, energy parity? And it, the, right now the wealthiest 20% of the world's people consume over four-fifths of the global goods and services. So again, there's that five-fold increase. And even allowing uh, that we figured out ways to cooperate and create a more equal prosperity, um, we may not be able to achieve that industrially and figuring out another route is a tremendous cooperation problem. Thank you for listening.